Okay, uh, let's move on with our class. In the last uh, lecture, we have begun to look at the electronic conductivity of extended solids in context of uh, band theory. And we established qualitatively that there are three different cases. So um, in one case, basically the fermi level cuts a band and then we have a metal with metallic conductivity. In the other case, we have a band gap in between the valence band and the conduction band. And in this case, we have either a semiconductor or an insulator depending on how large that band gap is. And we have the intermediate case in which the valence band and the conduction band touch, um, but the um, density of states at the Fermi level is zero. In this case, we have a semi-metal. We have then looked at how we can more quantitatively describe electronic conductivity in uh, extended solids. And we have said that the conductivity is a function of the uh, carrier concentration um, times the um, charge of the electron times the electron mobility. We have then looked at the electron mobility in more detail. And we have seen that the electron mobility is the charge of the electron times the relaxation time tau over the effective mass, whereby the relaxation time measures the time between collisions between the electron and the lattice. And the um, effective mass of the electron is determined by the bandwidth, which was shown by this formula here. So the wider the band is, the greater the, um, um, sorry, the smaller the effective, the, the smaller the effective mass and um, therefore the uh, larger the uh, electron mobility. Okay, so that means that generally wide bands are better for conductivity than uh, narrow bands. So here's an example for that. You see here uh, the band structure for copper. You know copper is an excellent uh, metallic electronic conductor. It's actually the uh, second best electronic conductor uh, after, after silver. And the reason for the high conductivity of silver is uh, the very wide uh, uh, 4S band, okay? Um, so here on the right-hand side, the band structure, it's a three-dimensional band structure. You see, we go from, from uh, <clears throat> uh, um, lambda to chi to uh, uh, to K and back to lambda. And you see on the left-hand side, the respective density of states. And you see here the density of states for the D electron. And you see that the density of states tends to be very high. And that is because the bands associated with the D electrons are uh, relatively narrow. But you see that the density of states um, for the uh, S uh, band is very small and that is because the S band is very wide. Now you can see that the Fermi level actually cuts through that very wide S band and that can serve as the qualitative explanation why the electronic conductivity in copper is that uh, high. Okay. Um, now, um, how can we uh, quantitatively describe um, the um, uh, um, number of charged characters um, in uh, more in more depth? You can do this using a function which is called the Fermi Dirac function, and you can apply the Fermi Dirac function to both um, metals and uh, semiconductors. And what the Fermi uh, Dirac function tells you is the, the fraction of the allowed states, F is a function of E, 
um, at a particular energy level, okay, that are populated at a uh, at a particular at a, at a particular temperature. So you see here that uh, farmer direct function. Um, so the fraction of the allowed states um, is one over one plus the exponent of the uh, energy of the uh, 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 crystal orbital that we that we look at minus the energy of the Fermi level over <coughs> over KT. Okay. So now you see here um, the uh, Fermi Dirac function and for both um, metals and uh, uh, semiconductors, semiconductors respectively. So now at uh, uh, T um, equal to zero, um, the Fermi Dirac function has a, a, a rectangular shape, okay? So below the Fermi level, the, the fraction of the states that are occupied are 100%, okay? Um, and above the Fermi level, the fraction of the states which are occupied are 0%, okay? So now as we go from absolute zero temperature to higher temperature, um, some of the electrons um, that were formerly in the ground state will be an excited state, okay? Therefore, as we go to closer to the Fermi level, the fraction of the energy levels that are completely filled will be no longer 100%, but smaller than 100, 100%, okay? Um, and at the Fermi level, 50% um, of the um, uh, allowed states will be, will be occupied. And then as we go above the Fermi level, okay, and now we are looking at the excited states, the um, fraction of the populated um, excited states will again decline as we go farther and farther above the um, for my level, okay? And the slope of this curve will become smaller and smaller as, as high, uh, the higher we go with the temperature. So you see here at T equal to T2, um, this, the slope um, is, is, is smaller. So the, uh, so, so electrons in the ground state, which has a, have a relatively low energy are now already excited. Um, and go into the into an excited an excited state, which leads to a flattening a flattening of this curve here. Okay, um, so now in the case of a <clears throat> semiconductor or an insulator, um, we have a, a, a similar situation with the difference that now you have here a band gap. Okay, so now here again, this is your Fermi uh, Dirac. Uh, a function here, but now not not all states are allowed anymore because of the band gap. Okay, so now all these states here in between the band gap are actually um, not allowed. Okay, so that means that um, basically um, the only relevant parts are this part here, and you see that at a, at a given temperature. Now a relatively a small uh, fraction of the uh, allowed, allowed states, um, allowed ground states are unoccupied. And that's because of the band gap, which is relatively wide. And uh, only a relatively small fraction of the excited states in the conduction band are um, occupied. Okay, one can also quantitatively um, calculate that when inserting particular uh, energies um, into this function here. Okay, so let's say, for instance, we are at the temperature of 300 Kelvin, 
and uh, 0 0.3 electron volts above the Fermi level, but I then just insert uh, 300 Kelvin for the temperature, okay? And um, <clears throat> well, 0 0.1 uh, volts for electron volts for the for the energy, and um, that will give you. Um, so here you insert zero point one volt electron volts for the energy, and that will give you the fraction of uh, states above the Fermi level which are occupied, which are two percent. Okay. So now um, that's all a little, um, but a typical semiconductor would have a, ba a band gap of approximately one electron volt. So if you insert one electron volt instead of 0 0.1 electron volt, you see that the uh, fraction of populated <coughs> states, uh, one electron volt above the Fermi level will be already will be already uh, extremely small, it will be only 1.6 times um, 10 to the minus um, 17, okay? So that would be uh, approximately the band gap for, for silicon, okay? And that explains why pure silicon has such a low electronic conductivity the number of charged characters that make it make it into the conduction band at a temperature of 300 Kelvin is just is just extremely small, okay. Whereas the uh, um, number of um, um, carriers that make it into the excited state in the metal is uh, significantly significantly larger, of course, because our, our uh, uh, band is only partially filled to so any crystal orbital above the Fermi level um, will count as an excited state and will allow for um, electronic conductivity. Okay, so now let us look more closely at the um, temperature dependence of electron conductivity. And uh, let us look at um, the uh, at look at the metals first. So now remember that the um, electron conductivity is proportional to the uh, um, number of charge characters, okay, but it's also uh, proportional to the relaxation time. Okay, um, so now when we increase the temperature, um, then we will in increase the um, uh, carrier concentration, but we will decrease the relaxation time because our ladders will start to vibrate more. Okay, and because of that, there are more collisions between the uh, moving electron and the lattice. Okay, so that means that you have two opposing factors. Okay, so now in metals, the carrier concentration in changes very slow with temperature. That's essentially because um, 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 any, any uh, crystal orbital above uh, the Fermi level is a crystal orbital that can be used to carry the uh, the charge and to excite uh, electron into this crystal orbital requires only a minimal energy. Okay, so overall the charge carrier concentration changes only slowly with temperature um, in a in a metal. Okay, however, uh, tau is actually inverse proportional to the temperature. Okay, due to the scattering by lattice vibrations. And therefore, uh, tau is actually dominating this equation here, okay? Therefore, a plot of the uh, conductivity versus one over tau, 
Okay, it's essentially it's essentially linear, and the connectivity goes down linearly as the temperature uh, uh, increases. Okay. When you plot one over t versus versus sigma. Okay. Um, so now we have a different situation in, in, in semiconductors because the charge concentration increases um, exponentially um, with um, um, uh, across the band gap. Okay, so it's proportional to eg over two uh, kt, the exponent of minus eg over. 2kt. So now, um, <coughs> if this if this term here is large, the band gap, of course, well, the exponent of that term will be large, and that means that uh, when you have a wide band band gap, the the temperature uh, dependence of between the uh, carrier concentration and the temperature is large. All right, so now tau is, is still just inversely proportional to the temperature. And that means now the number of charge characters here due to that exponential term is uh, dominating the behavior, okay? So as a consequence of that, the conductivity increases as the temperature increases. This is also how you can experimentally very easily distinguish between uh, a metal and a semiconductor or an insulator. Just do a temperature dependent electronic conductivity measurement. If the electronic, electronic conductivity decreases with the temperature, then you have a metal. When the electronic conductivity increases with the temperature, then you have um, uh, semiconductor or an insulator. All right, um, so now how can you improve the conductivity of a semiconductor when you can do this via doping? So there are two ways you can dope. You can either n-dope and p and or p-dope. <clears throat> And what this does is that uh, the doping introduces um, additional uh, uh, crystal orbitals um, into the band gap. When you actually uh, end dope, then that means that you um, replace a lattice atom by an impurity that has one additional valence electron. So for instance, when you have silicon as your semiconductor and you place a silicon atom by a phosphorus atom in your lattice, then you have n doped it and you have now one electron, additional electron available. Now, because of that additional electron available, you have now, um, well, um, energy, energy levels, okay? Uh, very near the conduction uh, band um, that are occupied. And the Fermat level is just in between, between these additional states and the conduction band. For that reason, now very little thermal energy is sufficient in order to excite these electrons into the conduction band where um, the electrons are uh, uh, highly mobile and can contribute to conductivity. So when you p-dope, you actually do the opposite. So you can, for instance, p-dope silicon with aluminum. So aluminum has one electron less. So now what this does is that this produces unoccupied uh, states uh, near the valence band, okay? And the Fermi level is actually uh, in between uh, these uh, unoccupied states and the valence band. And now you can very easily uh, 
excite electrons from the valence band into these new unoccupied states, where, which are now above the Fermi level. And as a consequence of that, your electrons are now mobile and your electronic conductivity is um, significantly increased. Okay. So this is what uh, N-doping and P-doping does. Um, I wanted to mention two more aspects of um, electron, electronic conductivity in um, extended solids. So the first one is um, the uh, influence of impurities in metal. So we've seen that in semiconductors, um, um, the doping actually increases the electronic conductivity. However, when we uh, uh, include the same impurities into metals, then that decreases the electronic conductivity. So you see here actually the um, um, specific uh, resistance or the resistivity of uh, pure copper as a as a function of temperature. And you see that it's actually a linear, uh, a linear um, relationship. And now you see here what happens when you replace 1.12% uh, of the copper atoms by nickel atoms. Okay, So nickel is the neighbor element to the copper. Uh, it has actually just one electron less. So you could think, well, now we uh, uh, peat, uh, uh, dope the, the copper um, with nickel. And what does that to the electronic conductivity? So in this case, um, we see that we have an increase of uh, uh, resistivity, okay? And that is because well, the nickel doesn't fit um, perfectly on the lattice, into the lattice. And so for that reason, there are additional possibilities for the collision um, between uh, an electron that moves through the alloy and the lattice itself. You see again that here the um, collisions with the lattice dominate the behavior. And the charge carrier concentration is 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 um, irrelevant, and the effect increases with increase of doping levels. So when you um, include two point one six percent nickel into copper instead of one point one two, the resistivity goes further up, and when you increase the nickel content even further, the resistivity goes up uh, even further. Okay, so um, you have impurity scattering, whereby the impurity scattering is proportional to the impurity, uh, is proportional to the impurity uh, concentration. All right, so the last aspect that I want to mention is that we, uh, uh, should distinguish between um, so-called uh, direct and indirect band gap semiconductors. So for instance, silicon is an indirect band gap semiconductor, whereas gallium arsenide is a, a direct band gap uh, semiconductor. So what does that mean? So now in a direct band, uh, gap semiconductor, the uh, uh, energy minimum of the conduction band um, lies actually directly on top of the energy maximum of the valence band within the case space. Okay, so you see here, um, the valence band for the gallium arsenide, and you see here actually the conduction band Okay, and you see here that the maximum of the valence band and the minimum of the conduction band, they are at the same position in, in, in the K space. Okay, and that 
facilitates uh, uh, electron facilitates electron transitions from the valence band um, into the conduction band. So your quantum yield is higher. Whereas when you have uh, silicon, then you have an indirect band gap conductor. So you see um, that the maximum of your valence band is here in K space, while the minimum of your conduction band is here in K space, okay? So that you have actually here so-called indirect band gap of uh, 1.1 electron two volt. The direct band gap would actually be the energy difference between here and here, yeah? And that would be uh, 2.5 electron volt. And that means that in order to excite uh, an electron from the conduct uh, valence band into the conduction band, you must couple uh, the um, excitation with, uh, with a lattice vibration, or you have to couple the electronic excitation with the phonon. Only under those conditions, you can actually uh, move an electron from the um, valence band uh, into the conduction band through the indirect band gap. So this is uh, quantum mechanically um, less efficient than the process of um, exciting electron within a direct uh, band gap semiconductor. All right, so this was uh, uh, the chapter about electronic conductivity in extended solids. And I have kept this uh, relatively short what I would like to do now is to discuss in more detail the conductivity in the ionic conductivity in extended solids, which is just as important as the um, electronic conductivity, especially in electrochemical um, devices, such as batteries um, or fuel cells. So let us begin with a comparison between um, electronic conductors, such as metals and uh, ionic conductors, okay? So in metals, um, you have a conductivity range between circa 10 Siemens per centimeters and 10 to the five, 10 to the power of five Siemens per centimeter. So the electrons, they carry the um, current and we've seen that the conductivity increases linearly as the temperature um, decreases due to the phonon scattering that we have discussed. So how does that compare with ionic conductivity in extended solids? Okay, we call such a solid then a, a solid uh, electrolyte. So you see that the uh, ionic conductivity uh, tends to be smaller. So ionic con Conductors tend to conduct at a conductivity in the range of about 10 to the minus three Siemens per centimeter and uh, 10 Siemens uh, per centimeter. So you see that this is orders of magnitude uh, lower than electron conductivity, but nonetheless, uh, the electron conductivity is, is still remarkable. So you can see that the highest possible uh, ionic conductivity is approximately as good as the worst uh, metallic conductivity that we can have um, a metal, okay? So the reason for that is that in contrast to metals where the electrons carry the current, in solid electrolytes, the ions carry um, 
the current. And of course, the, the ions are much, much um, heavier and larger than the electrons. And for that reason, their, their mobility is orders of magnitudes smaller than the mobility of the um, electrons, okay? Um, so the conductivity in this case um, decreases exponentially as the temperature increases or it increases in exponentially as the temperature increases, okay? And that's a sign that activated uh, an activated transport mechanism is in place here for the ionic conductivity. And that means that in order to conduct ions, we have to overcome significant activation barriers. Okay, and we can um, overcome these activation barriers um, exponentially more easily, okay, as we increase the temperature. Okay, so it's an Arrhenius type behavior that we see here. All right, so now uh, what are common types of solid electrolyte materials and which ions do they typically conduct? So we see here a list of them. So we know for instance, silver plus ion conductors. So silver iodide or it's ternary, ternary variant uh, rubidium, um, silver iodide are silver ion conductors. So we also know sodium ion conductors. So for instance, uh, sodium beta alumina, um, which is a sodium aluminum oxide, or nasicon, which is a sodium zirconium phosphoron, phosphorus silicon oxide are good um, ion conductors. We know a number of lithium ion conductors. Some also have uh, electronic conductivity as well. So for instance, lithium cobaltate is a lithium ion conductor, but it's also an electronic conductor. Um, it is actually used as a, as a, a cathode in, in lithium ion batteries, for instance. Okay. So there are other lithium ion conductors such as lithium manganate, lithium tungstate, or lithium um, borate. So yeah, hydroborate. <laughs> so we also know solid state proton ion conductors, for instance, cesium dihydrogen phosphate, cesium hydrogen sulfate, or uh, tungsten bronzes um, are good. Um, hydrogen ion conductors. So you see that these are all cations. Okay. There are also a few anion conductors, um, in particular oxide anion conductors. Um, for instance, cubic stabilized zirconia, um, bismuth oxides, and uh, defect perovskites. We also know fluoride ion conductors, for instance, lead fluoride and uh, um, earth alkaline fluorides. So we can think about um, what do these um, ions have in common? So when you look at the, the cations, you see that the cations all have a one plus charge, okay? So generally, ion conductivity depends on the charge of the ion. So, of course, an ion with a with a one plus charge, we can move uh, most easily through a lattice because the Coulomb forces in between um, the cation and the anion are the smallest. Okay. So the other parameter is uh, size. So you see that with, or, or you can also say mass. So you see that with the exception of the silver plus ions, um, these ions all tend to be light ions. So proton is certainly very light. Lithium is, is relatively light. Sodium is still relatively, sodium is still relatively light. So 
the, the, the lightness of the ions also plays a role for obvious reason. The lighter an ion is, the more easily we can actually push it through a lattice. Okay. But the size is actually not, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the size is not the only factor. We should also um, consider polarizability. Okay. The so polarizability is associated with the softness of an ion. So the softer an ion is, the more easily it can deform and the more easily you can actually squeeze it through a lattice. So that is the explanation why there are silver ion conductors. So silver has a one plus charge, but it's also a pretty soft ion that you can easily deform and um, squeeze um, easily through a lattice. Okay. Um, so you see that the relatively few um, um, anions relative to cations. One explanation is that anions tend to be larger just because they are negatively charged that increases the ionic radius. You see that the only ion conductors that are known are O2 minus ion conductors and fluoride ion conductors. That again, you can easily explain with size arguments. The so fluoride ions are pretty small in size, very small in size. O2 minus ions are just uh, slightly larger than the, than the fluoride uh, ions. So it's just essentially any heavy anions um, um, are not uh, possible to, to conduct. Okay, um, so here you see another uh, uh, little overview over how um, the different ion conductors vary in conductivity as a function of temperature. And you see here that this benchmark with concentrated sulfuric acid as a, as a benchmark. So concentrated sulfuric acid has a conductivity of about uh, one Siemens per centimeter at room temperature. So here you see that the, the logarithm of the conductivity is plotted versus 1000 of the temperature. So you, that means that here one would mean 1000 Kelvin, two would mean, well, 500 Kelvin, three would mean 1000 over, well, about um, 300 um, Kelvin. So actually temperature increases from the right to the left. And here conductivity increases exponentially. You see that these numbers um, are, well, numbers in the exponent. So they represent an order of magnitude. Okay. Um, so now you see that um, for practically all ion conductors, the ion Ionic conductivity increases with the temperature. We have discussed this uh, already before. Um, you see that in some cases, the electronic conductivity, uh, sorry, the ionic conductivity can reach values similar to those of liquids, such as concentrated sulfuric acid. So for instance, alpha iodide, as you can see here, uh, can achieve a silver ion conductivity, which is similar to that uh, of uh, concentrated um, sulfuric acid at temperatures um, not much above room temperature, about uh, just a little bit more than 100 degrees Celsius of room temperature. Um, similarly, um, rubidium um, silver iodide can achieve at room temperature a silver ion conductivity, which is only by about one order of magnitude smaller than that of concentrated sulfuric acid. Okay. Um, you see that the um, cation conductivities um, tend to be um, less uh, temperature dependent 
than the airline conductivities. So when you compare the steepness of these slopes here associated with the cation conductors, you see that they tend to be smaller than the slopes here of the anion conductors. So anion conductors such as um, fluoride or zirconium dioxide tend to have only very small ionic conductivities um, near room temperature. Only at very high temperatures, these ionic conductivities tend to become significant, but then they can uh, very steeply, very steeply increase. Okay and they can reach uh, values of, yeah, similar to the values of concentrated sulfuric acid at uh, very high temperatures, such as uh, 1000 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, so now when you look at um, this curve here, then you see that um, for the alpha silver iodide, you have uh, very high ionic conductivities. Whereas for a, a other phase, beta silver iodide, which is a different crystal structure, um, we have uh, an ionic conductivity, which is several orders of magnitudes lower. Okay. So that indicates that the crystal structure uh, plays actually a very important rule, uh, sorry, very important role for the ion conductivity. In that, in order to understand um, ion conductivity in extended solids, we have to very closely look at um, what are the crystal structure in of these ex of these extended solids, and how can these crystal structures actually explain high and low ionic conductivity, respectively. Okay, so much of to do, much of that has to do with um, defects. So the more defects a crystal structure has, or the more defects um, can be induced into a crystal structure, um, the uh, better the ionic conductivity tends to be. Okay, so therefore let us uh, look closer at, at defects in crystal structures and then see how defects in crystal structures um, influences the um, ionic conductivity. So you see here um, the delta G of a structure as a function of the defect concentration. Okay, so now as the name says, a defect uh, tends to be a high energy um, uh, a site and therefore the NCLP of a crystal structure increases um, linearly with the number of the defects that you have in a crystal structure. Okay, however def defects are also associated with this order with entropy um, and therefore from in the entropic standpoint, uh, the, uh, an increased number of defects um, uh, decreases the minus T times delta S value, which is also influencing delta G. And so entropy and enthalpy, the antagonists working against each other, which results in a free energy minimum, which you see here for this curve at a particular uh, defect um, concentration. Okay. And that's about the number of defects uh, that you can introduce into a crystal structure in order to uh, uh, increase ionic conductivity. So where this maximum lies here, well, it depends on the uh, exact uh, crystal structure. Okay, so the minimum is different for the uh, different crystal structures, which um, is part of the explanation of why um, certain crystal structures um, promote ionic conductivity significantly better than other crystal structures. <laughs> 
Okay. So looking further at defects, um, what kind of defects do we actually know? So um, generally, we distinguish between point defects, line defects, and plane defects. So uh, as part of this uh, course, we will look at point defects only because they um, are most responsible for the iron conductivity. So among the point defects, we distinguish between so-called Schottky and Frankel defects. Um, so what is a Schottky defect? Um, so a Schottky defect is a defect in which an iron pair is missing. So for instance, when you look here at the sodium chloride crystal structure, um, a Schottky defect exists when a pair of sodium plus and chloride minus anions are missing in the crystal structure. Okay. So in theory, these um, um, vacancies that are created are homogeneously distributed throughout the crystal structure. But uh, in practice, um, the uh, cationic vacancy and the anionic vacancy, they are uh, tend to come in pairs. So they are in relatively close proximity just because the opposite um, charges um, attract each other, okay? So here, where the chloride ion is missing, we have essentially a cationic vacancy because that vacancy is surrounded by cations primarily. Whereas this one here, where the cation is missing, is an anionic, is an anionic character with a negative charge because the cation which is missing is surrounded by anions. Okay, um, so what is the approximate defect concentration? Um, so the defect, con uh, uh, defect concentration tends to be pretty small. So for instance, in the case of sodium chloride, um, one of 10 to the power of 15 sites are actually vacant. So the defect concentration in sodium chloride is very small. So Schottky defects are more common for AB structures than for AB2 structures, simply because of statistical um, reasons. So we have an AB2, AB2 structure, then we have actually to remove three ions, two anions and one cations, um, which is more than in the case of an AB structure where we remove one cation and one anion. Okay, so opposed to that, um, we know so-called so Frankel defects. So in Frankel defects, one ion moves from its equilibrium position to a so-called interstitial site, okay? Um, so for example, in silver chloride, we can move a silver ion from its equilibrium position to an interstitial site. Okay, remember crystal structures are never completely filled structures. We always have some empty space available. Um, and well, for statistical reasons in well, thermal motion, a certain fraction of the um, cations and silver chloride are moved from the equilibrium position into interstitial sites where they have a higher energy. Okay. Um, so Frankel defects are much more common than for, for cations rather than for anions. And that is because cations tend to be smaller than anions. So you can squeeze more easily a smaller cation into a small interstitial site in comparison, in, uh, in comparison to an anion. However, there are exceptions, for instance, uh, in the fluoride structure, and uh, we will look at this, um, however, in the next class in more detail then, because I see that our time is over. So I just stop here the um, recall.